big, but it's the quality which can be big. So today we welcome uh, Dr. Emily Burns, um, our guest from um, Auburn University, but actually from the Terra Foundation of the American Art, which is based in, is based in Paris. Which is based in Paris, and uh, hopefully we'll be doing uh, more cooperation with that institution, uh, which starts with a lecture by, by Dr. Burns. She's an assistant professor of art history at Auburn University in Alabama. Currently, Terra Foundation for American Art postdoctoral fellow at the Institut National d'Histoire de l'Art in Paris. Pardon my French. Her research considers Franco American artistic and cultural exchange in the late 19th century and early 20th century, which we'll be uh, hearing about um, today. Her dissertation, Innocence Abroad The Construction and Marketing of an American Artistic Identity in Paris, 1918 10, explores the ways in which American artists perform ideas of cultural relatedness in response to French expectations about American culture. In addition to publishing articles related to her research on American studies in France, she's currently developing a book uh, that considers the visual cultures of the American West in the French imagination between the exposition Universelle of 1877 and the start of the First World War. And this book is titled Transnational Frontiers, the Visual Culture of the American West in the French Imagination, 1879-1914. It analyzes the intertwined relationship between art and popular culture, addressing questions of transnational exchange, native agency, and cultural nationalism. Her research has been supported by the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Smithsonian American Art Museum, Terra Foundation for American Art, Baird Library Society of Fellows, Walter Reed Hady Memorial Foundation, University of Nottingham, Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, Buffalo Bill Center of the West in, uh, in Cody, Wyoming, and I'll stop here. Okay, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Emily C. Burns. Thank you so much, and thank you for being here. Um, let's maybe turn the lights off so the images are stronger. And maybe, can I ask the people who are sitting in the far back to just move a little bit forward? Because you'll, much, you'll have a better experience. I think you will be able to, to more clearly see the visuals. <laughs> Art, so experiences. Yes, thank you, Richard. Always. Um, so, he just put that in the room, but I'm grateful to Peter for organizing my talk. Uh, and also, we have the colleagues at the Terra Foundation for American Art, who comes from Poland, Eva Bobrowska, is the person who organized and set up my visit to Poland. Uh, this is the first time I've ever been here, and I'm so excited to have the chance to visit Warsaw and Krakow uh, and share some of my research. And it's exciting always to talk about how national identity is shaped uh, in an international context. So I'm really looking forward to discussing these questions that are central to my research with you. Um, and also I'm excited to be at an American Studies Department. Uh, because even though I'm trained as an art historian and teach as an art historian, my training and the research questions that I'm most interested in are more about culture, perhaps, than about the history of art. And I think you'll see that um, in my discussion. In a lecture at the Sorbonne in 1882, the French historian Ernst Renan famously considered the question, what is a nation? In his discussion of nation building as a modern phenomenon, he noted, and here I quote, forgetting, I would even say historical error, is an essential factor in the creation of a nation. Here, Renan suggests that the quest for national character invites a cultural forgetting in a process of inclusion and exclusion. In the selecting and filtering of its creation, a nation is not a concrete or fixed entity for Renan and for us today as well, but rather a discourse and even in its constructions, a cultural mythology. At first, the role of forgetting in nation building might seem far afield from the discourses of the artistic movement of Impressionism, which, for those of you who haven't necessarily studied art history, is a movement that began in Paris in the 1870s with a series of independently organized art exhibitions. 
and their style, as seen in the two examples that you have on the screen by Claude Monet, are characterized by loose brushwork, bright colors, and often depictions of modern life with an effect of the momentary. In the context of art history, Impressionism is mainly associated with the development in modernism that draws attention to the formal qualities of the picture surface, whereas artists up until this point had been trying to erase any sense of the picture surface. Now we see this texture. Um, Monet's Impression Sunrise, which you see on the left, and the Boulevard de Capucine, which you see on the right, both deny naturalistic detail in favor of open brushwork and what we call impasto, the buildup of paint, on the flat surface. And in this, they break a long-held idea that painting should be a smooth window onto its subject. Yet, these modernist interventions are also wrapped up in the idea of forgetting. In the year after Raymond's lecture that I quoted before, the French critic Jules Laforge explained, the Impressionist is one who, forgetting the pictures amassed through centuries in museums, forgetting his optical art school training, has succeeded in remaking for himself a natural eye, and in seeing naturally, and painting as simply as he sees. Much as Renan notes the need to forget, to create a uniform national present, Laforge highlights forgetting an artistic past in Impressionism's focus on the immediate encounter between artists and subject. This construction also invites a process of selection and filtering, as the artist supposedly grounds themselves in space and time and creates a visual impression of their perspective. In this, the past is exchanged for the present, and these ideas are celebrated in John Singer Sargent's painting of Claude Monet <coughs> sitting outside and um, <coughs> eating, and Monet's depiction of his studio boat which offers contingent and dynamic scenes that are uncontrolled as the boat flows along with the current of the river. And one last framing example with the idea of forgetting comes from an American painter who was living in Chiverny, Lila Cabot Perry. She says that Monet had advised her, and this comment has become a staple to our historical introductions to Impressionism. When you go out to paint, try to forget what objects you have before you, and paint it just as it looks to you, until it gives your own naive impression of the scene before you. Perry, in the self-portrait that you see on the right, depicts herself with open brushwork and in the midst of a sidelong glance with a canvas in front of her. She's emphasizing Monet's approach as a forgetting of the subject in favor of artistic naivete and freshness. As a modernist art strategy, this approach to plein air painting requires a controlled forgetting, which the art historian Joel Isaacson has written about at length and productively historicized as, and here I quote from him, a rhetorical strategy and an index of serious commitment to develop a painting that would somehow break free from the constraints of entrenched theory and practice. End quote. While this idea has been analyzed through this art historical frame, its connections with the discourses of nationalism that interest me have been less considered. So I want to suggest today that Renan's comment about forgetting as a frame for nation building, and Laforge and Perry's discussions of forgetting as an artistic lens became overlapping discussions in the late 19th century. Both conversations, are centered around the terrain or landscape as a site of engagement and the delicate questions of time, immediacy, and memory. Writing about British landscape, the art historian Michael Rosenthal has observed that, quote, the idea persists that the image of the nation is the image of its landscape, end quote. And the historian Anthony D. Smith has argued that depictions of the local landscape made a nation real and concrete for its viewers. Because Impressionism implied an artist rounded in space and time, their embodied viewing, viewing is passed on to the viewer. In a period in which many critics considered the relationship between the local and the national, this transfer of place from artist to viewer 
participated in conversations about national character and even nationalism. But what were the terms around which Impressionism became engaged with nationalism and not just scenes of modern life in a cosmopolitan city? How did Impression and nation carry meaning in a French context? And more to the purposes of our discussion, how was the movement appropriated in international settings such as in the United States and in Australia? The art historian Virginia Spate has observed, quote, Impressionism tended to develop in countries in the process of self-definition, in modernizing democratic or democratizing societies whose relationship to the past was ambivalent. My discussion will develop this idea in analyzing Impressionism in the US and in Australia, where national culture was, in this period, defined around myths of newness. I will briefly consider how Monet in France reshaped the stylistic priorities of Impressionism in a national conversation in the 1890s, and then address how artists in the US and Australia in the same decade, such as Australian painter Arthur Streeton, whose picture you see on the left, and US painter Child Hudson, whose painting you see on the right, we'll come back to both of these, um, emphasized the original characteristics of Impressionism that implied new and fresh vision, um, but in these paintings on, on a large scale. Critics in both contexts celebrated these artists for enacting cultural mythologies of forgetting that highlighted what they saw as the unique characters of American culture and Australian culture in this period. And significantly, these appropriations transform a modernist strategy of artistic forgetting into a nationalist strategy. Most Impressionist painting, when the movement began in the 1870s, featured urban subjects. But by the 1890s, many French artists, including Monet, shifted to depicting rural subjects, like the one that you see on the screen and the detail on the right. Rather than painting single scenes, Monet developed, by, the 18, by 1889, the idea of making a series of a repeated subject. These shifts have implications for the reception to Impressionism. As the art historian Paul Hayes Tucker has argued, as a repeated meditation on the same subject, Monet's grain stacks of the small Norman village of Giverny suggest an ambition not only of formal experimentation to show the different effects of light on these objects, um, but also to, in here I quote from Tucker, to establish Impressionism as a national style um, and to make it a part of French cultural patrimony. Monet vocalized very little direct commentary about politics, but Tucker digs into the escapist and immersive qualities of these paintings and their rural iconography, which taps into a long tradition of celebrating rural life in France. And Tucker finds them ameliorative in a fraught national context at the end of the, or after the Franco-Prussian War, which had decades of reverberations in French culture, and divisive labor conflicts. The immediacy of the brushwork and the buildup of paint on the surface create a sense of momentary effect, which not only denies art history, but also any sense of history. And significantly, all of the grain stack paintings are entirely depopulated. And so we end up with this kind of symbolic space um, and in this momentary quality, a kind of forgetting that Renan had talked about um, in the decade before. But interestingly, when we look at these grain stacks as a series, um, they take on a different kind of function than Impressionism and its values of immediacy. Because by seeing their repeated subjects, we end up with a sense of continuity um, over time. Um, and a celebration of this cultural legacy of rural France through repetition. So in the series, Monet is attempting to fix the ephemeral and feeding and give it duration. And so in a way, he redefines Impressionism as it is reshaped as a national movement. But we'll see in the context of the American painters and Australian painters who embrace the style, they want to maintain the ephemeral and fleeting and that becomes the centerpiece for their mythologies of paint and nation. Now let me give you some background about the artists' embrace of Impressionism um, in these two traditions. 
And since the late 1870s, American and Australian painters began to experiment with plein air painting or painting outdoors. And this is at the same time as the French Impressionist exhibitions in Paris, which took place from 1874 to 1886. But not all plein air painters necessarily took up Impressionism. And in neither country was the engagement with the style of foregone conclusion. Rather, we see it as a, one of a range of stylistic options. Um, and it's not necessarily a dominant force in either place. In the US, there was a group known as the 10 American Painters, and I show you a, a portrait of them here on the screen, who codified American Impressionism as a group. Um, and two examples of this group, John Bachman and William Merritt Chase, um, whose northeastern US landscapes I show you here. Uh, but this group was not formalized until 1897. Artists who embraced this style and also who sought painting experiences in Chiverny, where Monet was working, um, had visited the colony since the mid-1880s. In Australia, in 1886, the Australian Artists Association was formed to celebrate greater experimentation with painting outdoors. Excuse me, and several of these artists also visited Chiverny. One of the central painters in this movement, Tom Roberts, um, turned to Box Hill and Heidelberg um, with a group of friends. Um, and these were just little villages outside of Melbourne um, in the mid-1880s. And in the painting that I show you on the screen, which is actually quite small, it's about this big, um, Roberts um, celebrates the campsites and the artist community in the so-called Australian bush. Um, and also in A Quiet Day on the Darabin Creek, um, Roberts depicts two artists grounded in positions on opposite sides of the, the stream. You can see one very clearly in the right foreground, but um, in the left, um, kind of up on that hillside, is another artist. Um, so he's celebrating the different grounded perspectives that these artists are taking in the landscape and painting outdoors. Um, and in 1889, this group organized an exhibition, which was called the 9 by 5 Impressions, at an artist stationery company in Melbourne called Buxton's that also had a gallery space. The exhibition featured these plein air paintings, on, uh, some of them on actually cigar box lids. Uh, and they were mostly in the size that gave the show its title, 9 by 5 alongside other small um, sketches by these artists that were kind of like pochades trying to capture um, a momentary quality. Now we'll talk more about these appropriations of Impressionism um, in the context of Australia and in the US. Um, but before we do, I want to talk briefly about um, what happens when these foreign artists are making landscapes in Shiverni itself. Um, it's worth asking um, whether um, if Monet's projects are supporting the fecundity of the French nation and its rural heritage, when these foreign artists are um, appropriating this style and depicting the same subject, do these objects carry the same cultural weight? Um, and I show you some examples um, on the upper left, American painter Theodore Robinson's Afternoon Shadows. Um, on the upper right, um, uh, also a U.S. painter Theodore Wendell's Chiverny Freestack. Um, on the lower left, Dawson, Dawson, Watson, yes, that is his real name, uh, his haystacks, which is actually owned by the museum at Auburn, where I teach in the US. Um, and then uh, he's originally from Brittany. And then on the right, you see another Shigirini haystack by E. Phillips Fox, who is an Australian painter working in Shigirini. Um, and then I'll also add to the list a series um, that was made by American painter John Leslie Breck of Studies on an Autumn Day, which he actually made over three days in 1891, uh, the same year that Monet showed his grain stacks at the Durand Royal Gallery in Paris. Um, and I'll also add to this list, because we are in Poland, the Normandy haystacks of Polish painter Józef Pinkiewicz, um, who I'll mention briefly at the, again at the end of the talk. So we have this tradition now of foreign artists coming to Giverny and depicting haystack scenes. It would be easy, and indeed scholars have argued, that Monet is the artistic center that has shaped these foreign artist interventions in a kind of belated modernist ripple effect of Impressionism style and subject. 
But what I find more striking about bringing these paintings together is actually how distinct they are in handling. I don't think in looking at these examples, even though they're sharing a subject, that they are um, stylistically interchangeable with each other. Um, for example, while all use loose brushwork and bright colors, each artist has a subtly different handling of the medium um, and different engagements with space as well. So if you look at the Fox painting um, at the upper right, um, he studied in France in the 1880s and he comments that he visited one of the Impressionist exhibitions and he says, um, and I quote from him, I found very interesting. Uh, and he says that he likes their ideas. But he also says in his letters that he likes their ideas in moderation. So he doesn't want to be as extreme as he sees in their work. And indeed, rather than replicating the round strokes that Monet uses, Fox uses small, rectangular, almost staccato brush strokes. He also creates a deep sense of recession if you follow the four haystacks into the background, whereas Monet's painting emphasizes the flatness of the single um, grain stack. Um, Breck's series, and I'll show you one of the paintings there at the lower right, is more engaged with geometry and flatness and thin planes of modulated color than loose brushwork. In Afternoon Shadows, Robinson's painting at the left, the artist distances the grain stack from the viewer in the composition, and really instead his subject is this dark line of shadow um, created by the trees on the right side of the composition. In these stylistic differences, the paintings highlight the individuated vision that Impressionism invited, rather than a mere following of a formula after Monet. Um, most of these paintings were not exhibited in France, although a few of them were. Um, and in that context, they might have supported the same kind of French artistic and cultural hegemony and the rural, char the rural character that Monet cultivates. But when exhibited in their respective countries, Contemporary viewers tended to deride these paintings in their quest to define a national, excuse me, in their quest to find a national distinctive art. For example, in Boston in the 1890s, depictions of Giverny, such as those by Robinson, received slight from a reviewer named Greta, who wrote, "Do not these pictures of an imitator of Monet have a family similarity of color effect?" so that you can instantly recognize them as that stuff? Is there then any emancipation in this new style? Is there anything in it but the substitution of one set of conventions and prescriptions for another? For Greta, Robinson's Impressionism merely produced another, reproduced another formula for painting. Another Boston reviewer was more generous to the work of Theodore Wendell than of Robinson, when their paintings were shown side by side in Boston in 1892. And this reviewer, Helen Moulton, skirts by Robinson's Chiverny paintings and instead focuses on Wendell. And she insists that Wendell, and I'm quoting from her, is not a blind follower of Monet. Um, and rather, he has, um, and here again I'll quote from her, he has evolved a method and manner of his own. And what differentiated Wendell for this viewer was that he was depicting American subjects in the Gloucester region of Massachusetts. So perhaps taking a cue from these critics, uh, Robinson um, began to paint American subjects in this next year, trading in his Giverny landscapes. Um, and one particular example um, from 1893 is his Port Bend at uh, Delaware and Hudson Canal, which is in upstate New York and which he exhibited at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. In a scene of an abandoned industrial system of canals made defunct by the construction of railroads, Robinson draws the viewer into an ephemeral moment through the light and shadows on the clouds and his broken brushwork on the landscape. Robinson's painting approach transforms the canal from industrial product to natural artifact. And critics highlight the artist's embrace of American subjects and so-called American light. Um, and if you get the chance ever to visit New York and you go to the Museum of uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, they have four paintings by Robinson there, and two of them are from Giverny, and two of them are painted in the U.S. And they've placed them on a corner so you can kind of look at them side by side, and if you can see the um, the ways in which he's trying to play at a discourse in which the different colors and lights 
actually signifies the landscape where he's painting. Now, Australian Fox, who I mentioned before, experienced a similar response to his Giverny scenes in Australia. He exhibited this painting in Melbourne in 1892, uh, but it went unmentioned in the press. When he, like Robinson, began to paint Australian landscapes, such as this painting of Heidelberg, critics had a mixed response. Some complained that he was falsely trying to apply French light and color to Australian scenes, rather than responding to the colors of the local environment. In 1901, the Australian critic and artist Lionel Lindsay complained uh, that Fox has tried to introduce French effects into an Australian setting. It may be unpardonable to paint Australian landscape in a French method, but it seems outside the pale of common reason to look for the atmospheric effects of France in a land altogether alien from them in tone and color and form. And so you can see this, uh, this critic is shaping an idea around the sense that the landscape, the terrain itself, has um, qualities which are unique to that place. And if an artist can engage with those unique qualities, their painting can speak to a national um, culture. As many critics of American Impressionism who complained about artists wearing French spectacles, Lindsay is challenging Fox's use not necessarily of the French style of Impressionism, but of colors that seem to the critic to be belong to the French landscape and not the Australian one. Critics in both the Australian and US context drew out a similar remedy to this conundrum. In response to xenophobic complaints about an influx of French styles, critics advocated a celebration of the local landscape and its local features and colors to mitigate artistic influence. The American critic Hamlin Garland uh, offers a solution to this tendency towards gallicization in an essay entitled Local Color in Art, which he published in 1894, just the year after Robinson started to exhibit his um, American scene. Garland argued that style could be international, but if the subject matter was local, art would tap into national culture through the eyes, palette, and touch of each artist. He wrote in a language that emphasized forgetting the artistic tradition, quote, each painter should paint his own surroundings with nature for his teacher. Garland stated, and I'm quoting from him again, a settled conviction that art to be vital must be local in its subject. Its universal appeal must be in its working out in the way that it's done. So for Garland, plein air painting becomes a strategy to define the local around immediacy. And an engagement with the local could enable an artist to forget that this cosmopolitan style has a legacy and in favor of the grounded individual vision that these critics are seeking. And Garland uses this frame to celebrate and champion Robinson's American scene. The same comments about embracing local color disseminated in Australia. While Fox had struggled with the reception of his paintings in Australia as possessing a foreign palette, some of his contemporaries, including Arthur Sweden and Jane Sutherland, painted Australian haystacks, uh, also with loose brushwork, but with, according to critics, greater attention to local color uh, than Fox had managed to achieve. Um, both the Strickman and Sutherland's Australian scenes draw the viewer back from the brain stacks in favor of depicting the vastness of the landscapes that they inhabit. And this kind of um, large scale of the landscape is a trope that you see both in Australia and in the US in the 19th century. Um, these paintings emphasize depth rather than the surface. Sutherland's large scale suggests her goals to create an immersive experience for the viewer. But interestingly, she pales out the colors implying their desaturation behind the light of a hot sun. And the distant hills fade to a distinctly purple tone um, in the background. Um, and if you read the literature about Australian landscape in this period, the kind of purple haze is often referred to and it becomes um, a kind of visual signifier of Australian landscape. Um, Streeton's Australian December on the left gives the earth a stronger red tone and more dramatic sky. The paintings reveal experimentation with applying this transnational style to the local scene, in which color and light become signifiers of the local, as they do in Robinson's depictions.
section of the Fort Bend Delaware Canal. So incidentally, after I found these paintings, I started to look to see if American artists also painted American haystacks. Um, and the answer is generally no, but I did find one example, which is the one I show you on the screen by um, Edward Burge Child, um, who also spent some time working in France, and then made this picture of Vermont haystacks. And back to Stream and Sutherland, Australian critics raved about these paintings, um, called them a surge of um, uh, distinctly local scenes from the Australian bush, and incidents from Australian life, which revealed, and quoting from one critic, that the sentiment of this new southern world is beginning to find artistic expression, and that the penumbra of a genuinely Australian school of art is veritably visible. In 1890, Sidney Dickinson, who was an American critic who was based in Australia, offered similar advice on the local to Australian artists in a lecture and related article entitled, What Should Australian Artists Paint? <laughs> to acquire the accomplished methods of a school like the modern French, and to bring to bear upon them their individual and national feeling, is what he advises. This middle ground makes the transnational style of Impressionism palatable in nationalist settings. And it also redirects the discourse from influence, Monet's influence over these artists, to appropriation, that the artists are taking the style and bringing to bear upon it their individual and national feeling. Now let's talk more about what these national mythologies are in the US and in Australia in this period. And I suggest to you that in their embrace of the local, artists and critics are using Impressionism to tap into mythologies that claim youthfulness, a lack of national tradition, or a cultural relatedness as a positive, um, and a perpetual state of forgetting. Now in Australia, it's really interesting to read this literature because these claims to an Australian school of art are referring to this at a time when Australia is not actually an independent nation. Um, their statehood is a slow and kind of vague process. Um, the colonies of the Australian continent were federated in 1901, um, and after World War I, there was an Australian diplomat who was represented at the Treaty of Versailles. Um, but independent jurisdiction was not given to Australia until 1931. But Australian cultural identity is clearly posited and expressed and desired long before the colonies graduate to become a sovereign nation. As early as the 1870s, newspaper critics and politicians start to seek definitions of what an Australian character looks like. Um, and in 1884, the British politician, Lord Archibald Philip Roseberry, gave a speech in Adelaide in which he articulated that Australia was already, quote, a nation not in aspiration or in the future, but in performance and in, fa in fact. Now these discussions about cultural identity were not necessarily linked with ideas of secession. Um, one historian, Douglas Cole, has argued that patriotic considerations of Australian character did not equate with a desire to separate from Great Britain, but rather to just establish a, a unique local character. Um, but at the time of Australian um, Federation in 1901, the Sydney Morning Herald declared in here I'm quoting from the newspaper, an entry onto a new and broader nationhood. Um, and interestingly, when Australians talk about their national history, the date of federation is much more important than the official um, uh, statehood of 1931. Thus, the idea of a unique cultural character is functioning um, separate from political formal nationhood. Um, but this character, and I'll say more about this in a few minutes, frequently cited cultural newness. During the late 19th century, the US was far from new nation status. Having celebrated the centennial of its independence from Great Britain in 1876, yet many contemporary critics posited that it still held fast to the stereotypes of the revolutionary period. The literary historian Malcolm Bradley has observed that a myth of America as lacking in tradition and history maintained its currency even after the founding of other new nations, including Italy 
and Germany. Many Gilded Age writers and politicians participated in invented notions of new nationality in spite of the increasingly complex layers of American history. And, and I'll just mention two of them. Mark Twain pointed out the irony of American youth in 1883. The world and books are so accustomed to use and overuse the word new in connection with our country that we early get and permanently retreat, retain the impression that there is nothing old about it. And then um, similarly, uh, humorously, in 1893, Oscar Wilde joked about the dichotomy of youth and age in the context of the US. The youth of America is their oldest tradition. It has been going on now for 300 years. Um, Twain and Wilde mocked the resounding international proclamations of American youth and innocence in a period known for the nation's political, economic, and cultural ascendancy. Um, and this is a trope that still recirculates um, in the US context. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that um, in the Q&A if you would like. Um, so critics begin to equate if neither Australia or the US have a history. And there were a few critics who made parallels between these two locales and suggested that both were more experimental than other places because of this character. Um, they used the mythology of youth to refer to artists' experiments. Um, often, the beginning of Australian and American schools of art were referred to in the literature as births. Um, and critics sought to transform the liability of lacking a national tra tradition into an asset. Um, for example, in 1891, the same year Monet's grain stacks were exhibited, Gilbert Parker, a Canadian critic for London's Independent, claimed that modern art privileged naive vision and rep that replicated a first encounter with, na with nature. He declared, be naive. That is the keynote of French painting. It is the primal chord of naturalness, the final touch of individuality, the power behind achievement, the secret of genius. For Parker, displays of naivete in art derived from the discourses around Impressionism signaled authenticity in the artistic experience of the chosen subject. But it was the vast contingent of American artists in Paris, and not the French, who, for Parker, offered the most extreme sense of naivete. What command better suited to the American temperament, he asked. If it is, has any quality which is conspicuously imminent, it is naivete. It is a habit of looking at things as if they were seen for the first time, with no intervening veil of convention and tradition." End quote. Um, Parker claims that American culture was more innocent than others because the American, and I'll quote from him one more time, is made to be independent and free from the youth up. He is impelled to think things out for himself. He is told, in effect, from his cradle to be naive. Um, and this is a mythology that um, has been developed all through the 19th century. There are even comments in um, Alexis Tocqueville's um, Democracy in America about this idea that the American will not take um, a way of doing something because um, they would rather find a new way um, to, to, to complete whatever, whatever task. For Sidney Dickinson, the American critic I mentioned before in Australia, American critics were, and I'm quoting from him, showing in art the freedom from considerations of usage, which is characteristic of that country. So this mythology of lacking convention um, leads to paintings of visual discovery that then become exemplars of the national imaginary. But Dickinson has even more to say about art and the youthful nation of Australian culture where he's living. Um, he describes Australia frequently as a new country and a young country in the midst of developing an artistic school. He argues that Australia's geographical distance from Europe um, meant fewer models, um, and the opportunity, and here I quote from him, to make their painting and sculpture the true reflection of national life and to express the quality of life that is purely Australian. He describes in paintings that he saw in 1888 as exhibiting, um, and I'm quoting again, remarkable skill and energy, a freedom from prejudice, and an independence of conventionality. Dickinson implies that these characteristics would enhance a unique Australian cultural identity 
that art would actually feed the nation state. Noting, quote, the history of every country shows that art has strengthened and not weakened its power, influence, and nationality. And this is really, um, I think, a, a typical comment of the late 19th century, this belief in the intertwined na uh, nature of nationality and art. And I was really interested yesterday, I visited the Jewish Historical Institute um, in Warsaw, and they have a, an exhibition of, um, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but an exhibition of Jewish art in their collection. And the curator is clearly grappling with how to convey not only national Polish identity, but also religious identity in these pictures. And there is a quotation on the wall that's from a, a, a little later than the period I work on, uh, from 1928, in an essay about um, Jewish art, um, in which the author argues, and I'm quoting from that, no patriotism has ever given rise to art. And it really struck me as um, a distinction from the period that I work on in which there is this um, perceived close relationship. And I think that in the interwar period, there is a greater skepticism about the role of art in the building of national culture. Um, but back to the late 19th century, discourses of youth are closely wrapped up um, in artistic production um, of Impressionism in both the US and Australia. Um, the cult of the new shaped much of the rhetoric of the Heidelberg School. The artists themselves were quite young and at the start of their careers. Um, in their selection of Box Hill Camp as an artist colony, Roberts and others um, described a, quote, breath of fresh air from the tired atmosphere of the studios where we forgot everything. One of their favorite iconographical features was the young sapling gum tree, um, which you can see some of them in the right of the painting on the left, um, which contemporary is interpreted as a metaphor for youthful Australia. When they wrote to the Melbourne newspaper, the artists in support of their 9 by 5 exhibition of impressions, Roberts and Streeton insisted that they sought to, quote, forget for the moment our own ideas of what ought to be in a picture. These approaches, which privilege immediacy over finish, they concluded, will mark a great school in, of painting in Australia. These artists are playing with the parallels between art and national newness, uh, describing a, quote, new country where art is so young and so tentative. But these ideas are closely and repeatedly in dialogue with Impressionism, even in France. Um, John Russell, an Australian painter who most closely adopted Monet's palette and brushstroke, and even built a house on Belle Isle, an island off of Brittany where Monet also painted in the 1880s. Russell wrote to Roberts in 1887, isn't great art innocent of style as to the manner of painting? Russell advised his fellow painter, go and forget style. These artistic strategies bolster constructions of perceptual and artistic innocence. James Carroll Beckwith, an American painter who worked in Andé, which is a Norman village a few hours west of Giverny, also engaged with discourses of forgetting and the innocent eye. In 1882, he depicted two versions of um, the scene I show you here, a man seated on the bow of a boat floating along with the river current. With the bright palette and loose brushwork, Beckwith offers homage to the idea of painting outdoors, as though the sitter enacts his own artistic project. Imagining the direction of the boat continually, continually altering his artistic subjects suggests that the painter's vision is constantly regenerated and constantly uh, renewed with fresh perspectives, and the artist doesn't even have to do anything. The river takes, um, um, takes him along. Um, and a uh, plein air painting for Beckwith allows him to experiment artistically, and he uses the same kind of comments about forgetting as Roberts in, in Australia. Um, he complained about his sorry, he complained about his art studies in Paris. Quote, I had learned how to paint and now I wish I did not know. Um, but in the countryside, he sought to, and I'm quoting again from his diaries, to forget all my method and to shake off all my habits of working. And I will follow the Impressionist search for a road removed from the recognized system of schools. This mythology allows Beckwith to eschew the specter of artistic influence even as he's painting the French subjects. 
these experimentations with the local in the US and in Australia were first tentative and small scale, such as in Robinson's Port Bend, Delaware, and Hudson Canal, and um, sorry, Robinson's Port Bend, and Roberts, Darabin Creek. But by the 1890s in the US and Australia, artists like Struton and Child Hassan embraced larger scale painting projects and a panoramic mode that bolstered these cultural mythologies of grounded, fresh vision. This shift in scale within the visual frame encouraged the viewer to extrapolate from the local to the national. Struton exhibited his deliberately large scale painting of Hawkesbury River near Sydney in 1896. Like Robinson, the artist folds modern industry into the panorama of river landscape, but elevates its subject in a poetic title, The Purple Moon's Transparent Night. Streeton takes a much more panoramic perspective than the more intimate Heidelberg paintings, and he blanches out the color to give a sense of the heat and brightness of the sun. These visual strategies are paralleled in Sutherland's paintings of Australian haystacks, you might remember the purple um, from her stack painting that I showed you earlier. Um, but um, here, he takes a wider angle and creates a greater sense of the expanse of the landscape and a panoramic mood over it. While his romantic title draws from the English poet Percy Shelley, contemporaries focused on how he captured local light and color on a grand scale. The tone of the local and immediate enabled Streeton a valorized position in the art world in a community that came to celebrate that he had never traveled to Europe until the very late 1890s. A nationalist critic writing about Child Hassan in 1914 celebrated the vigor of the artist's brushwork in paintings of American subjects, such as Ironbound of 1896, which depicts the rocky coast of Mount Desert, Maine. One writer announced that his local subject had separated his style from European antecedents, and critics read him through a nationalist lens. One announced, stemming from Monet, he has made the formula of Impressionism his own and imbued it with the native tang of our own soil. Following this critic, many writers in the 1920s and 1930s announced Hassan's Americanness and how essentially American his work is, one elaborated. He has absorbed the European influence of his younger days and stands alone profoundly American. And this all comes through the embrace of the subject matter. To declare his vigorous national identity, critics discuss a gestural energy and a thick investo applied to areas of bare canvas. And there is um, a kind of critical level of forgetting, too, in which they're trying to um, erase any um, connection of this international style of Impressionism. But interestingly, while nationalist critics in the early 20th century valorized both Streeton and Hassan as exemplars of the national in these two contexts, these Impressionist painters have experienced inverted fates in the later historiography. The so-called Heidelberg School or Australian Impressionists are still often held up as the first national art Australian school um, because of the local subjects. Whereas in the US, even though there has there have been a few monographic exhibitions on Hassan, in general the American Impressionists are treated more as a moment of cosmopolitan distraction from a nativist art because of the painting style. And so in a way Garland's dictum about the local subject um, sort of beating out uh, an international style held, held, holds faster in Australia than in the US. But these examples of Beckwith, Roberts, Hossam, Robinson, and Streeton suggest that Australian and American appropriations of Impressionism are not cases of belated modernism, which would narrate the influence of French styles from the geographic metropole of Paris working to the periphery of faraway Australia and the United States. Instead, the examples reveal artists and critics' active engagement with the style, iconography, and polemics of Impressionism and plein air painting more broadly in dialogue with the cultural politics of the nation. In the nationalist context of the late 19th and early 20th century, the local landscape serves as a middle ground between redefining national culture and participating in a cosmopolitan art world. 
the innocent eye became the rhetorical mythology that supported this artistic trajectory, forgetting an international style with a youthful national bent. Yet, in the context of art and in the context of nationalism, forgetting actually demarcates a paradox. As it's impossible to forget artistic styles and traditions or to forget a painting that you've seen, um, a knowing naivete is a paradox. As, as Parker implies in his comment in 1891 about Americans being told from their cradle to be naive. If you're told to be naive, then you, if you're knowingly so, you're actually not. Um, and in the same way, creating national narratives invites a forgetting that Renan knows, and he talks about this, is an impossible act, um, often to erase trauma. There is indeed a more sinister political paradox at work in these constructions of national identities of cultural innocence. In both Australia and the US, these mythologies skirt and hide the complex realities of power struggle and social and racial inequalities of what Homi Baba has described as a, quote, strange forgetting of the history of the nation's past, the violence involved in establishing the nation's writ. After the Civil War in the US in the 1860s, tropes of cult cultural innocence circulated more avidly than before. As Henry James wrote, quote, the Civil War marks an era in the history of the American mind. James concluded that after the war, the American has, quote, eaten of the tree of knowledge, end quote. He's intimating that the war caused a paradigm shift in American culture and self-perception, triggering a fall from a position of innocence. James's imaginary expulsion um, participates in a, a larger, compulsive cultural need to regain that innocence, though it was troubled and paradoxical from the start. But significantly, the kinds of claims that I've presented to you today about American newness and innocence um, and youth resound even more loudly at the end of the 19th century than um, in the period before the Civil War, as though um, the moment that geopolitical events suggest its impossibility, it becomes all the more important to claim it. Knowing postures of innocence found in these paintings of immediacy and in the local landscapes um, an attempt to remedy a culture shattered by the realities of slavery, war, industrialization, um, and apprehensions about the place of the US on the world stage. Similarly, as the revisionist art historian Ian McLean has asked, what is hidden in Australian Impressionists' claims to what he calls immaculate conception? In Australia, as in the US, the specter of troubled and unresolved relationships with indigenous populations belied national constructions of cultural innocence, as well as literal and political ownership over the land. Uh, creating national belonging, in these cases, clearly enacts a process of exclusion. For McLean, the tensions between the local and the national, and even eventually the imperial, remain unresolved by the Heidelberg artists. In this context, forgetting become, as a modernist strategy becomes what he describes as a repression, which he finds actually haunts these paintings. In both cases, as defining itself as a culture without a history, Australian and American Impressionisms skirt the social realities of their distinct settler colonial histories. Now in closing, I invite us to add to our consideration and discussion the national historiography around Polish painters of the late 19th century. And this is absolutely outside of my field of study, um, but I think that the, the kind of framework that I've presented could raise some interesting questions. Um, thinking about the artist um, Joseph Pankiewicz and um, Vladislav Podkrinsky. Uh, uh, who also studied in Paris in the 1880s and who made French scenes, um, but also employed Impressionist handling to depict both rural and urban scenes in Poland. Um, so I show you Edgar Neck the Haystacks that I showed you before, but then um, another um, painting by Pinkiewicz, and then two um, by Podkowinski um, that um, adopt this um, Impressionist handling. I'm curious, what is forgotten here? Um, in appropriately for our conversation today, the Young Poland Movement, of which these artists are also often associated. 
where do we find the overlap between the immediacy of Impressionism and narratives of the nation and landscape, um, and immediacy and memory? So I thank you for your attention and welcome your comments and questions. Are you familiar with the two Polish artists that I show? Yes. <laughs> and what do you think of them and their work? How, how is it presented um, in kind of Polish national narratives? So I think that in Poland everything is uh, connected with patriotism and nationalism in some way. Mm -hmm. So it's like obvious that when I see some Polish painter, I connect him with some kind of patriotism. No uh, matter what he's painting or she's painting? No, well, of course, if it's some mm, very abstract thing, it's, it's different. But uh, when I see uh, the street, it's like mm, totally Poland, Warsaw, you know? So, uh, but I think it is just it's a, it's a historical, and historical uh, feeling, yeah, we have here. Uh, I'm actually, uh, I have never looked at uh, at impressionism as 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 uh, nationalist and uh, patriotic uh, art, so I think that was uh, very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Are you persuaded about the subtleties of well, this connection? Well, uh, it's definitely. Yeah, I think I would like to deep uh, to dig uh, into. Yeah. Which okay. was very interesting. Thank you. Are there perhaps um, images that you want to go back to or talk more about? I think during your talk, you just ask about whether America is still young and new. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm asking. So you're asking. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I think that this mythology still holds weight. Um, and I think it's so fascinating because it's obviously been a long time, but um, you can find examples of it in the media sometimes. And um, there's one example that caught my attention when I was working on my dissertation, which was all about this concept of naivete and cultural identity. Um, and it was in a speech from Obama uh, that he made in, I guess it was like around 2009, 2010. And he says that um, America is not as innocent as we were when Roosevelt was president, but this is a state in which we can we can return, we can regain this character. And I found this really interesting because, first of all, he doesn't say which Roosevelt he's talking about. I assume he means FDR. Um, but he also implies that in the period of FDR or whichever Roosevelt he's thinking of, there was a moment of cultural innocence that needs to be regenerated. And it was in a speech related to um, progress of American war in Afghanistan. And so it, it took on, I think, a, a desire for that kind of cultural mythology. There is a book that is uh, by a Jungian psychologist named Barry Spector, who lives in California. And it's called Madness at the Gates of the City, The Myth of American Innocence. And it's a peculiar book because it's, um, it's Jungian and it's uh, it embraces uh, de in detail um, Greek mythology, but um, Spectre argues on the larger scale that there is an obsession with a, in, within American culture with being innocent, and he argues that that has been the source of every major internal and external military conflict that the United States has ever had. Um, from the kind of um, demonization of American Indian communities um, to the treatment of black Americans to international um, wars. But he argues that innocence always needs to be threatened in order to survive, in order to regenerate itself. And so he argues that this cultural mythology has actually motivated American, you know, these American military um, encounters. And I, 
I'm not unpersuaded by his argument, in fact. Um, and, but I think he's, the impetus behind his book is political. He wants this mythology to go away, uh, and thus the military engagements as well. Um, but obviously it's more complicated than that. This project uh, came out of, um, after my dissertation, I went to Australia to take a break from academics for a month to travel around. But then, of course, as an art historian, I like to go to museums wherever I go. So I end up working anyway. Uh, but when I started to look at the paintings of the Heidelberg School, I realized these kinds of visual similarities with what American Impressionists were doing. And then um, started to read more about the, read some of the secondary scholarship about the paintings, and that's where I started to find the kind of parallels in the mythologies that are being enacted um, in these two places. And so that's kind of been the, the lead into this um, material, which is now an article project. Well, I don't want to keep you if you don't have additional questions, because I know it is your finals about to be your finals time, and I thank you so much for taking time out from your busy schedules to come and, and talk with me. Thank you. Thank you very much.